Ensuite, Wayne Nicholson, Gaetan Chester Duval, M. Racine, votre prénom, vous allez m'aider. Claude Racine, Marcel Imbaud, Sylvain Laflamme, and we have Annie Benoit. 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 And I will start with Mr. Benoit, seeing that Yvon is not here. Mr. Benoit, or Benoit, back in the 1990s, I believe you raced in the 1990s, and if I'm wrong, please correct me. Um, you uh, raced Formula 3 uh, on a skidoo, or several skidoos, and um, yeah, if you can just maybe come over here, it might be easier for... Uh, can I have a two? The hot seat. The hot seat. And it's, it's very informal, by the way. So, Mr. Benoit, you have you can have a seat, no problem. I'll stand a little bit. Okay. Um, you came up with quite a few ideas um, in order to make your race sled go faster. You had a lot of success on the racetrack because of the ideas you came up with. My question to you is, can you maybe give us examples of those, of those ideas that um, you developed and the relationship that you had with Gaetan Chester Duval in developing those ideas. We're going to back up here just a little bit. I started racing for Bombardier in 86. Is that right, fellas? Uh, close. Right around there, 86. One of the things I came up with that way back then, Bombardier only had a clutch spring that was 250, 380, or something like that. 250. And I decided that we needed more clutch springs. So I knew this guy in Montreal, and he made me all these clutch springs. I gave him all the dimensions to the clutch springs, what we needed. And he made them all. Well, I gave a spring one time for one of the fellows that was racing Formula 3, and I didn't race Formula 3 that much. Because he didn't have a very good hole shot. So I gave him this spring, and he weren't supposed to tell anybody. There were, there were secret springs. Only I had them, because I had them made. Well, a couple of weeks go by a race, and Marcel comes in my trailer, and he sits down, and he says, all right, what's up with the clutch springs? Because <laughs> that other fella told you you got a clutch spring from me. So that was one of the things that we did. So, And there was a lot of things that we did, but... I don't know if I should talk about them because. <laughs> Go right ahead. Talk away. Those are the old days. <laughs> Long gone. Well, I don't want to talk about them too much because you know, people might get mad <laughs> about it. But... No. <laughs> no DQs today. <laughs> I never got thrown out for anything I was doing. It was always something else. I got tossed out in uh, Eagle River one time. I borrowed a pipe from somebody. That was because, the, uh, hey, that was because you were from the east. <laughs> what was that? Except the uh, uh, Nicholson Cylinder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, that was a Valcor. Yeah. I was testing some cylinders. We'll say this. I was testing some 670 cylinders. And they worked a little better. Absolutely. Or nickel cell instead of cast iron. So I go into the teardown shack, and it took that guy almost two days to figure out there were nickel cell cylinders. He finally figured it out, and he, had, he was flopping them around. Flop and he asked me to put, to put those uh, cylinders, because he won't really mad those cylinders. <laughs> yeah, he wanted the cylinders. So I'll ask another question. I have another question. What I'll do is I'll ask the questions to um, each racer. I have about two questions. Um, Mr. Benoit, I can uh, gather from your name, Benoit Benoit, that you're probably from French Canadian ancestry, our descent, descendants. And um, my question to you is, and on a more personal note, um, when you would come back to, or when you, when you come to Quebec Valcourt and you'd be amongst Marcel and Gaetan Chester Duval, did it bring you back to, I mean, did you find that you maybe discovered your roots as... Well, I always wanted to learn how to speak French, but it never happened. I really did, because my great-great-grandfather came from Quebec, and that's how I ended up with Benoit for a name. Of course, English is Benoit, but I like Benoit better. 
but we had a lot of good times. Can I tell you a few stories? Go right ahead. <laughs> well, the, the boys flew. Oh, first thing I want to do before I forget this, I want to thank Chester and Marcel for all the help that they gave me when I was racing Skidoo's. Without them guys, I would have never been as fast as I was. So I really thank you guys. I got a lot of great memories because of you guys. And I know the times that we had our little spats and But if it wasn't for those guys, I wouldn't have won all the races. So, thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Benite. Yes. Mr. Nicholson. Uh, Wayne Nicholson, you race snowmobiles um, very successfully from 1969 to, I believe, the mid or, 19, mid or late 1990s. Is that correct? And um, the question to you is, how is it that you started in 1969, along with many other racers, for instance, Yvon Duhamel and Lucien and, and Mike Trapp, and they stopped racing in the mid-1970s, late-1970s, and here you are, so many years afterwards, still going and being as successful as you, as you were. You can just... The hot seat, right there, Wayne. It's the hot seat. <laughs> I... I believe deep down inside that uh, there's a reason we're all on earth. I mean, I, I'm not uh, trying to push religion, but uh, there's a reason I'm still here. We had a lot of close calls during the years that I raced in terms of uh, major crashes, but uh, fortunately I escaped uh, from most of those with uh, very few injuries. Um, I guess my duration or my time period that I raced for over 30 years, the reason for that is because I, I was fortunate enough to keep myself in good shape, and to this day I still do. Um, I was on uh, great racing products, not all of them, as Lanny knows, were meant to go around in ovals. Uh, many of these were just consumer-based sleds, and that's why I felt that uh, in the late 70s when I kind of phased myself out of modified racing and got into the stock racing I kind of asked Skidoo if that was the direction we needed to go and I think I was working with Chester at the time and uh, we were running uh, just production sleds, stock production sleds and I raced those for the next almost 10 years until I got the call from uh, Marcel and Beau, uh, that I would be one of the first Formula 3 drivers because of the performance that I had sustained uh, racing the, uh, the faster stock production sleds. Now, when you won a race at Eagle River, you were supposedly a world champion, and that was very important, important to everyone. When you won a race at Valcour, that was important to the people that were the heart and soul of that sled that you raced on. Those were the people that produced that sled. They were the people that you needed to go out and race and win in front of. And when you won at Valcour, not only the world knew about you, but also the people that have meant the most to the people that produced that sled for you. And uh, once again, I feel like I'm very fortunate and very blessed for the length of the career that I had and the many victories I had. And I want to tell you something. Lanny, during his span that he raced, maybe not as long as me, probably had more victories in terms of, uh, uh, let's say, feature wins. But every feature win that you had, especially the older that you got, the better it felt. I can tell you that. Some of them were more special. The only sled that I ever kept during the 30 years I raced is currently on display out at uh, St. Germain at the Snowmobile Hall of Fame. It's the 1990 F3 uh, factory sled. There was only five of them produced. I believe that's the only one left in existence that I know of, and it's in its original race condition. It's the only F3 sled that I never crashed, and uh, it came off the last race uh, I believe it was Valcour, and we put it in my basement, and it went out to the Hall of Fame the year I was inducted, which was in 2011, and that was the only sled that I ever gave my wife Kathy a victory lap at Peterborough, and also my mother, I gave her the victory lap at Valcour on that sled, and to this day, that is probably the most special sled, and I also have my fur boots, the last fur boots I wore, they sit on the sled, and also Lanny's dad, who always came up to me, and I never forgot, he gave me a bear claw for luck, and I wore that bear claw on those original leathers 
and they transferred from leathers to leathers to leathers. They're still on my original leathers out at the Hall of Fame, also that bear claw that your dad gave me. All those things, you know, you don't think uh, you have a little luck in life? Well, guess what? I'm a baseball player, and I'm, I'm pretty pretty touchy about different things that bring you good luck. Well, there's certain things in life that have brought me good luck, and that's why I'm sitting here talking all of you today. Thanks for that question. So Mr. Nicholson, um, my next question is, um, was there, in order to be successful, a difference when it came to the physical attributes of a racer when chosen to race either Formula 3 or Formula 1? And if so, can you explain to us what were those differences when it came to the physical attributes? The Formula 3 was a different animal, as most of you know, and there was a reason for its upcoming in the uh, late 1980s, and there was a reason that it fell apart in the late 1990s. Uh, a lot of it in the late 1990s had to do financially, because uh, Marcel knows how expensive it was to keep those sleds on the racetrack. In the late 80s, uh, money was no object to the factories, and uh, that was a way to showcase their top production snowmobiles and to give everybody a chance to see how fast these sleds could actually go. And there's a reason why they're not allowed to run in the vintage classes. Uh, there's a reason they stopped producing them because of the tremendous horsepower that was involved. I mean, even at the very end of Formula 3, we had three cylinder engines that were putting out close to 200 horsepower. The sleds weighed between 420 and 440 pounds. You do the math, it's like taking a vehicle that weighs 3,000 pounds and putting a 1,500 horsepower engine in it. That's, that's the kind of acceleration that we had toward the end of Formula 3. It wasn't made for everybody. The guys that ran those sleds were strong guys, guys that had uh, pretty big bodies. I, I was fortunate because I was kind of tall and lanky and a lot stronger back then than I am now. But it, it took a different kind of driver to take and, and run those things into a corner at almost 100 miles an hour. And, and be able to get them through the corners. I mean, it was a different type of feeling. It's something that will never be erased from my mind, and uh, it's it's one of the one of the things in life that I will never ever forget. You know, the time that you would leave the starting line, whether it would be at Balcourt or at Eagle River, and charge that first turn with sleds of that caliber. Can I ask you what the difference was racing Formula One as opposed to? Formula 3, um, the attributes of a racer that would race Formula 1, such as Jean Villeneuve. Can you maybe just add a few words, please? Well, that that's a... It's not really fair to compare apples to apples there. I mean, it was Formula 1 drivers. Uh, I won't say they had more finesse, but, but they didn't have to have the big body attributes that the Formula 3 drivers had. You could have a small driver that could just sit there. Uh, they didn't have to do a lot of leaning because the sled did a lot of work for them, so to speak. Um, sometimes when we had the Friday night thunder races out at Eagle River, that was a, an attribute to tell you whether the Formula 3 sleds or the Formula 1 sleds would, would match well against one another on the racetrack. And that, was, uh, that didn't go too many years because there were too many, too many high-speed crashes. There were sleds that were coming into the corner way faster than they needed to be, and Formula 1 sleds that were there that were not going to speeds, and that's why they kind of did away with that Friday night race. It was uh, too much equipment was being trashed, but it was two different types of sleds, completely different types of sleds. Formula One sleds pretty much, not, not to say they drove themselves, but they were much easier to drive through the corners. They were meant to go around an oval racetrack where the Formula Three sleds were not. Thank you, Mr. Nicholson.